Okay, hello. Um, oh, and since I apparently didn't bring my printed notes, In the, I'm not sure if I really need the printed notes. They're like a they're like a security blanket. <laughs> like as long as they're there, I feel like I know what I'm going to say, even though I don't always swallow what it says. <laughs> All right. Anyway, um, okay. So there were two. Uh, parts of the assigned reading today, the second part of the second meditation and these various scattered pieces from the principles of philosophy. Um, uh, and they both come to the same surprising conclusion, namely that bodies are not sensible. And in fact, sensible qualities are not even accidents in bodies. Um, Right, so I mean, first of all, this is a departure from the meditator's old opinion. This is the beginning. Remember, I kept saying before that the meditations, you know, we're going to start by doubting the existence of the world, and we're going to end up by proving that the world does exist, but it's not going to be exactly the same world. <laughs> That we thought we were in for, <laughs> right? So, uh, right. So remember, um, the um, the meditator at the beginning of the second meditation says what they've always thought a body was. Um, as to the, so there's actually a. Um, I guess they have to decide what, oh, sorry, I'm getting all in. So there's, there's a transition here from the body, meaning like my body, to body, meaning like body in general, um, right? And I hope everyone understands that maybe this isn't completely obvious, that in this kind of philosophical context, body just means whatever takes up space. Right, so like the air in this room is a body. Um, right, so um, and so like in in English, you can make that distinction by by saying the body versus body. I mean, you can also say my body, but uh, the meditator doesn't say that mostly in this paragraph. You can say the body, meaning my body versus body. But as I keep mentioning, there there are no articles in Latin, so <laughs> they have to the stack translators actually have to decide when it's switched from one to the other. So anyway, as to the body or as to body, however, I had no doubts about it, but thought I knew its nature distinctly. If I had tried to describe the mental conception I had of it, I would have expressed it as follows: By a body, I understand whatever has a determinable shape. Now, I could spend a lot of, so again, the translation isn't exactly right here, I think. Um, it actually says, in the, in the original it says, some, it is apt to be determined by some shape, right? That's different from has a determinate shape. <laughs> um, and actually, that very distinction, Avicenna makes a lot of it when he talks about corporeal form. That is what it is that makes bodies bodies. Uh, but um, but maybe it's not that important here. I don't know. I mean, it's going to turn out, right, that the wax what the meditator was thinking of all along when they thought of the wax was not something that has a determinate shape, but something that's apt to be terminated by a shape, right? Because it can change its shape and still be the wax, right? So um, 
But anyway, here we're talking about the meditator's old opinion. So it has a determinable shape in it. Well, actually, they say determinable shape. That's better. But it's still not the same thing. Anyway, in a definable location and can occupy a space in such a way as to exclude any other body. So that part actually is going to turn out to be right. But then the next part, it can be perceived by touch, sight, hearing, taste, or smell. This is going to turn out to be wrong. Um, so, um, uh, and moreover, the difference is going to be compared to um, Should I talk about that yet? The difference is going to be compared to um, when I when I had those sense perceptions and I thought or said I'm seeing the wax. Um, what I should have said is. I'm inferring that the wax is there from the fact that I have those sense perceptions. And the comparison the meditator makes is between that and the people walking in the square. And the people walking in the square are wearing these big like Dutch hats and like popped out coats and stuff. <laughs> and so the meditator just sees hats and coats actually. But they say, and think, I see the people, but it turns out it's not true. So, um, so again, like, again, one way of describing the change is that eventually the meditator is going to realize that they were dreaming. And moreover, the dream was exactly the kind they're worried about. Dreaming that things are clothed when they're actually naked, or mistaking the clothing for the for the body, or something like that. Right. Anyway, um, um, so uh, so this is different from the meditator's old opinions. It's also different from the people we saw from all the people we saw at the beginning of the course. Right. So, like according to Plotinus. A sensible substance or body is qualities and quantity. It's qualities and quantities in matter. Right? So like the wax would be like there would be a quality of whiteness and there would be a quantity and there would be a quality of shape, quantity of how big it is. And there might be these other qualities and fragrance or whatever that Descartes talks about. And, you know, some of these we count as completing the substance and others we don't. But in any case, that's all that's there. Um, and we call it a substance because it's an image of a, a true substance, an immaterial substance. Right, like the form of wax. Uh, right, so this is Plotinus. And then Porphyry says, well, no, I mean, so Plotinus says this isn't really a substance at all. It's called substance equivocally because it's an image of this kind of substance. Porphyry said that. Um, there's a substantial form which is made out of things that otherwise would be accidents. But here, since they're parts of the substance, they're not accidents. Right? So again, I I didn't know what the substantial form of wax is. Like, so again, once you get outside of the elements, no one really knows what the true differentiator are, <laughs> even when you get the simple things like wax. <laughs> um, but, you know, could whiteness be essential to wax or I don't know. Anyway, um, and then there's these other sensible properties that are accidents. Um, and then according to Avicenna and Thomas,
throat, uh, the sense the substantial form is not sensible. Right. So remember, like according to this view, when I see the wax, the the if the whiteness is essential to the wax, I'm seeing the wax's essence. <laughs> uh, here in this picture, no, there's there's some kind of substantial form, and it has some it has um, attributes to use the term that Descartes and Spinoza are going to use here, right? Or differentiate that make it the kind of thing it is. Um, uh, but those are not sensible. And then there's two kinds of sensible accidents in it. The ones that are caused by the substantial form, um, that, that naturally follow from the substantial form. And we use those in place of the differentiate because we can't sense the differentiate. So we infer from the fact that this accident is in the wax, let's say, this accident of the whiteness, we infer that there's this substantial form here. We infer that there's wax there. Um, and then there's other, again, there's other sensible qualities or quantities or whatever that are um, that are accidental. They're, you know, they're caused by external substances. Um, so according to Descartes, well, I mean, first of all, the substantial form is not sensible. Second of all, there's one principal attribute that makes it the kind of substance that it is. And third of all, it has no sensible properties. Um, but somehow in my mind, and we haven't gotten to any of the details of how this is supposed to happen yet, but it's gonna turn out to be hard to understand when we get the details. This is like a famously problematic point in Descartes' philosophy. But somehow this thing causes, so like, this is my mind. This, this thing causes a kind of accident of whiteness in me. And from that, I infer that this substance is there. So, I mean, you'll notice that, um, like, as we're moving this direction, in a sense, we're moving farther and farther away from Plotinus. But in another sense, like, if you look at it sort of topologically, <laughs> so to speak, we're moving, like, so, he, so here, the real substance is super sensible, and there's these accidents here. That are its image that we call we're calling a substance. Yeah. Um, does the like if you're using the, the whiteness as an example for like our mind, which is allowing us to infer the substance, does the car still view that whiteness as a as a quality or no? And he doesn't use that terminology for it. And it's okay. I mean, you know, so but it's a mode of thought. Um when we think of it as whiteness, it's we're kind of we're we're perceiving it in a confused way because we're taking that mode of thought and somehow trying to like mixing it up with something about a body external to us. So um, he's not like he's not like arguing that like uh, qualities make us infer that something there or accident makes us infer something. It's just something. Well, I mean, it is, I mean, so mode, I'm going to get to the terminology in a second, but 
mode is basically, it's not exactly equivalent, but it's basically what we've been calling accident, right? So when we say that this is a mode of a thinking thing, we mean it's an accident of a thinking thing, right? And, you know, so like the thinking thing can continue without it, <laughs> um, but it can only exist in a thinking thing. So, um, um, so, I mean, he doesn't call it a quality in my mind, but uh, but it's a it's a, it's some kind of accident of a thinking thing. Um, okay, and so and oh, sorry. So I was in the middle of saying when. So here we have the the true substance is super sensible. Now, I mean, already here we have like if you kind of pulled this out, <laughs> it would be kind of similar to this picture, right? Like you're already taking the true substance and making it nonsensible anyway. But you might as well call it super sensible, right? And you're leaving the accidents out here to infer or to, to image it or something like that, right? Um, and here it's even now, I mean, it's it's still not exactly like this because we're still saying somehow that these accidents inhere in this as their subject, whereas these accidents inhere in prime matter as their subject. Um, but here it's even closer to Plotinus in the sense that if you like turned it over, <laughs> then the true body the substance is something that's not sensible, but there's something we confusedly think of as the body, which is actually just an image of the body in our mind. <laughs> um, now, I mean, um, now I was going to say. I think this it's actually useful even in Descartes to think to start thinking of it this way, but it's going to be even more important in Leibniz. Um, so, uh, who, by the way, uh, says that that when he was young he read a lot of Plotinus. <laughs> uh, all right. Anyway. Um, Okay, and so one thing to notice about this is that it's not just something, a quality like whiteness that is being, that Descartes is doing this to, but even shape, insofar as shape is a sensible or imaginable property. So shape in some sense is gonna be left down here, geometrical shape as a mode of extension, but not the shape that we can see or imagine. Um, Um, right, so on page 82, says, Im this is, yeah, it's near the bottom of page 82. I don't know what else to say for people who don't have page numbers. What line number? What line number? Well, do we have the same line? I mean, I don't have line numbers. I have the, yeah, I have the page the numbers in the, um, whatever it's called, the yeah, Dom Tannery. Do you have do you have page numbers in the margin like this? No, but we have the those in brackets in the. Oh, okay, like this one is 28. Okay, perfect. So it's on, yeah, this is, I don't know how to pronounce these names properly because they're French, but it's called AT, <laughs> Adam Taneri, or however you pronounce that, edition of the works of Descartes. And see, at the beginning of Meditations on First Philosophy, it says AT7. That means it's volume seven of that. So you could, you know, you can cite this as, AT 
<laughs> that way, any it's just like there's systems like that for Plato and Aristotle and you know a lot of philosophers. There'll be a standard edition so that everyone can find it. All right, and so I'll say those from now on. Yeah, so it's uh, it's on at twenty eight <laughs> and. Um, uh, imagining is simply contemplating the shape or image of a corporeal thing. So, um, imagining, which uh, Descartes also, and this is an old Aristotelian term, calls common sense or the common sense. Right, it's supposed. It's called the common sense because it's supposed to be something where, so to speak, like all the senses. Um, well, there's there's different ways of explaining why it's called common sense, actually. But so to speak, all the senses like send uh, images into the brain, and then they're collected together. Actually, Aristotle thought this happened in the heart, but later people uh, thought it happened in the brain. Um, they're like collected together by a common, in, a, in like a common organ. And that's where we're able both to like put them, to put like sight and touch together into the, um, like combine them both as ways of representing shapes, but also like where we're able to, so to speak, see things even when they're not there. Right, so like that's what imagination or uh, phantasia in in Greek. That's what that's what the technical understanding of that faculty is, and the early modern people understand it the same way. So strictly speaking, when we talk about imagination, we're talking about so to speak seeing pictures or images. Um, and um. Um, when Descartes gets to talking about what it is, or when the meditator gets to talking about what it is that she really thought the wax was. Um, so this is on page 84 or 30 through 31 um, in the, the AT numbers. What exactly is it that I am now imagining? Let us concentrate, take away everything which does not belong to the wax and see what is left, merely something extended, flexible, and changeable. But what is meant here by flexible and changeable? Is it what I picture in my imagination that this piece of wax is capable of changing from a round shape to a square shape or from a square shape to a triangular shape? Not at all, for I can grasp that the wax is capable of countless changes of this kind, yet I am unable to run through this immeasurable number of changes in my imagination. And I think this actually becomes clearer from something she says at the beginning of the sixth meditation. So this is on page 111, and it's the AT page 72. Um, to make this clear, I will first examine the difference between imagination and pure understanding. When I imagine a triangle, for example, I do not merely understand that it is a figure bounded by three lines, but at the same time, I also see the three lines with my mind's eye as if they were present before me. And this is what I call imagining, right? So again, imagining is like seeing a picture of it. But if I want to think of a kiliagon, right? So a kiliagon, I've sometimes heard people pronounce this chiliagon, which is funny, but it's not right. It's, it's, this is a kai, it's a Greek word. All right. Anyway, um, a kiliagon is a polygon with 1,000 sides. Right. So if I want to think of a kiliagon, although I understand that it is a figure consisting of a thousand sides, just as well as I understand the triangle to be a three-sided figure, 
I do not in the same way imagine the thousand sides or see them as if they were present before me. It is true that since I am in the habit of imagining something whenever I think of a corporeal thing, I may construct in my mind a confused representation of some figure, but it is clear that this is not a Kiliagon, for it differs in no way from the representation I should form if I were thinking of a Myriagon, right? A Myriagon would, would have 10,000 sides or, or any figure with very many sides, right? So the point is like, um, I understand in the, both the case of the triangle and the Kiliagon, um, I like this. I guess I'm going to erase this whole time a second. Um, in both cases, I understand what shape we're talking about. Right? Like I can preach things about it. I can prove what, if it's a regular Kiliagon, I can calculate what the angles are between the sides. Um, but there's something else I can do in the case of the triangle that I can't do in the case of the Killian one, which is to also see a picture that represents that figure as opposed to some other figure. Yeah. So it seems to be putting some uh, restrictions on our imaginative abilities, especially things that are very detailed and very limited, or elaborate, excuse me. Yeah. So how does that not extend to dreams too? Because I've had some very realistic dreams, but I always know they're dreams. In this case, the way we're perceiving reality is similar to that of the Killian one. It's, it's hyper realistic, extremely detailed, compared to most dreams don't have a thousand sides of details compared to the triangle. What is he saying? Um, that he couldn't imagine each of the thousand sides, or just that he doesn't? I just don't know. It should be. No, sorry. Anyway, um, so yeah, and this this new <clears throat> That's good. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, <laughs> uh, um, sorry. What was I thinking before I started correcting the dreams on the board? Um, <laughs> uh, dreaming. All right. Okay. So first of all. Um, remember, I said the meditator doesn't actually claim that there's no difference between dreaming and being awake. Um, right, like to that last objection, which says these things wouldn't occur so distinctly to someone who's sleeping. The response is not, um, uh, no, there's no difference at all. The response is, but I remember making arguments to myself when I was dreaming that I couldn't be dreaming and then I turned out I was. So I clearly don't have reliable criteria. Right, so, um, so I mean, because again, in the end, Descartes is gonna conclude that there is a difference between dreaming and being awake and that you could use it. <laughs> um, so, uh, but I'm not sure that, so that's number one, but number two is I'm not sure that's the right way of understanding the problem here. Like, it's not like you could see a Kiliagon. The, the problem isn't with imagination as opposed to seeing. The problem was imagination as opposed to understanding, right? Like seeing isn't gonna be any better here. And it's, I mean, uh, I, I don't know if they, if, I think Descartes picked this example carefully, or anyway, even if he didn't, he was lucky because it's like, the problem here is, is like the problem here can't be fixed by magnifying it. Because the angle is too small for us to tell the difference between that, that and a straight line, mm -hmm. right? Like, in other words, if you actually drew a kilogram, it would look like a circle. Sorry, that's not really a circle, but <laughs> right, because you you uh, you wouldn't be able to see the angles. And as you like zoom in more and more, it would still look like a circle, it would still like a circle, and then it would look straight. 
but you would never be able to see that angle right? because it's it's too close to 180 degrees. Um, so you can't see or imagine Achilles' mind. Yeah, and you know, and Descartes says, and you can tell you're not imagining it, and you you also wouldn't tell you weren't seeing it because yeah, I have some image when I think of Achilles, but it's the same image I would have when I think of Myriad. And since Achillegon and Amirigon are not the same, because 10,000 doesn't equal 1,000, <laughs> those images can't both be accurate. Um, right. So, and I think going back to the second meditation, with it, you know, when the meditator says, like, um, is the changeability of the wax the ways I can imagine it changing? And the answer is, well, no, that's not enough. It can change in so many more ways than I can imagine. I think it's you should think not so much that there's just too many to go through them all, but that there, but that there are going to be possibilities like this that we can't imagine. Um, I mean. There's actually something worse about it than, I mean, the existence of these type of examples is uh, like, I guess, somehow a consequence of the infinite divisibility of space. Um, and the infinite divisibility of space means that there's relationships between lines that, that um, no finitely detailed imagination could represent, <laughs> right? Like if this is side one, this is a square of side of side one, and you ask, how long is this? And you know, I mean, so you know that. Don't just say well, have but you know that a square on this side would have twice the area of this square. You can see that from the picture, right? <laughs> like if the picture were better, you could see it from the picture. <laughs> this right, because th these two parts make up this original square, and then you have them again down here. So this square has twice the area of this square. This square has area one, so this square has area two, um, and you know um, you can prove that no matter how the small the parts are that you divide this side into, no whole number of them would be the right length to have the area of this square root of two, right? Or as we usually say, the square root of two is irrational. Um, so, right, what that means is that if you think of imagining, I mean, this is, maybe isn't really the way Descartes thinks about it, but if, if, but if you think of imagining as kind of like pixels, it's probably not the right way to think about it either, but anyway, <laughs> but it's, but it's probably not, it's probably something that's not better than this, <laughs> put it that way. Right, like if you think of imagining as having like little pixels in your head, or seeing for that matter as having like a little pixel display, right? Then no matter how small the pixels are, if there's a whole number of them here, there won't be a whole number of them here. So you could never imagine this relationship, but you can understand it perfectly, according to Descartes, um, and according to Socrates and the meaning. <laughs> um, right, this this is the example of Socrates discusses them. All right. Um, so I mean that may seem like kind of a side note, but I I think it, this is actually really important, right? That this 
the world that we're left with contains shape and motion, but it's not the kind that we can see or imagine or feel. Um, now, uh, how do we, how do we know, like, how, how can we show that, that bodies don't have this type of properties, like color, or the kind of shape we can imagine, um, or sound? Although that one is always weird, right? Like Descartes has to, when Descartes talks about the sound of the wax, or the meditator talks about the sound of the wax, they say, it makes a sound when you hit it. <laughs> Not, it has a sound. Well, anyway, sorry. I mean, it's not clear really that all the different senses are 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 as similar to each other as philosophers often want them to be. <laughs> but never mind that. Okay. So um so how do we know this that that these sensible properties are not in bodies? Well, so um in the principles that's it's shown using the synthetic method Right? I don't think I ever talked about that, but remember I signed that thing from the objectives and replies about the analytic method versus the synthetic method. Um, right, Because someone said to Descartes, um, why don't you put the, why didn't you put the arguments in the meditations? This was one of the objections. Did I even mention the objections and replies at all? I don't think I did. Okay, so first I'll say, before Descartes published the meditations, he sent them around to various people and asked them to come up with objections. And then he wrote replies to them. And the meditations were originally published with the objections and replies. I think um, I think there were some objections and replies that were added in the second edition. But anyway, basically it was originally published with objections and replies. Um, some of the people, well, the most famous person who wrote objections was Hobbes. Um, but, um, and uh, Hobbes actually had a lot of connections in France. He was in, I'm sorry, this is <laughs> irrelevant. All right, anyway, <laughs> now Hobbes lived in Paris for a while. I think uh, during the Civil War, he was, I don't know. Anyway, that is the English Civil War. Um, but so in any case, one of them was Hobbes, another one was Mersenne, who's famous for the Mersenne crimes. Uh, uh, others of them were like kind of like various Jesuit people or whatever. Um, uh, oh, I think Arnaud was one of them. Anyway, so one of these people, I'm not sure which one it was actually, says, uh, why don't you, Descartes, why didn't you put this argument, why didn't you make it more geometrico, that is, in the geometric, geometrical method or way, custom? Um, and Descartes, in the reply, said, well, um, uh, you know, for certain things, that's a good method. And the way it works is that you start with very simple definitions and axioms that your reader will have to accept. And then you uh, proceed by a long chain of argument where they, where they are forced to accept every step. And then you give them a conclusion and they have to accept the conclusion. Um, but he says, but for first philosophy, that's not an appropriate method because here the main problem is the unclarity of the concepts. Um, and so rather than starting that way, you have to start, so to speak, from the other side. And that's what he calls the analytic method. Now, analytic and synthetic are terms from ancient geometry. Um, the, like the, the synthetic procedure is what we think of as a geometrical proof. And the analytic procedure is something like you say, well, suppose the thing that's to be proved and then show uh, like somehow moving back from that. 
in any case, that's not exactly what Descartes is using it to mean, but that's, but that's, the, that's where he's getting the terminology. So he's saying in first philosophy, rather, you start with what they, the confused thing that the reader thinks, and you gradually like reduce it until it becomes clear. And then they learn what they were thinking all along in, in clear terms, right? And you can see the meditator going through that very procedure when they talk about the wax. Um, so anyway, but the principles of philosophy uh, um, is, I mean, it's not really more geometrico or geometrico, geometric. <laughs> anyway, depending on how you pronounce Latin. Um, but uh, we'll, I mean, we'll see that in its full form in Spinoza for the definition and axiom, theorem, proof, whatever. But the principles of philosophy works more in that other direction. So in the principles of philosophy, the part I had you re read, Descartes is like proving based on general principles that you're so supposed to accept that this is true of bodies, right? And the way it works is that um, um, Oh, 163. No, no. Um, so book one of the principles, section 53, this is page 177. And it's the AT pages, page 25. This is, um, a different volume of the edition, right? This is act. This is eighteen eight twenty five. All right, but anyway, just for people who have those numbers, um, to each substance there belongs one principal attribute. In the case of mind, this is thought, and in the case of a body, it is extension, right? So. This is the, so like in the analytic method of the meditations, this hasn't been proved yet in the second meditation. In fact, remember the second meditation, we haven't proved that bodies exist or the ge or even the geometry is reliable, <laughs> right? That's, the, the, all those things are still in doubt. Um, but, uh, but uh, what is, you know, like, stated as a theorem in the principles in, is we're preparing for in the second meditation by, by looking to see what we were actually thinking all along when we thought about a body. Um, so, right, so like this is the, the world we're gonna be heading for. Each substance has one principal attribute. So that's as much as to say that um, each species of substances is a lowest species. Um, why do I say that? Well, so So this terminology that Descartes is using, and Descartes didn't invent this, but I'm not sure exactly where it comes from in the Middle Ages. Um, but uh, so like some Aristotelians also use these terms, attribute and mode. Um, but the way Descartes is using them, um, the attribute basically corresponds to the differential or at least the principal attribute, right? Like, it seems like he's willing to call other properties um, of, of a substance also attributes, but he's really only interested in the principal attribute. And the principal attribute is the one that makes the substance the kind of thing it is. And each substance only has one of them, right? Whereas this, 
as I said before, basically corresponds to accidents. Right, so we're saying that there's one genus of substances and the Descartes uses the term race that is thing for that genus. And then there's two species. One of them is defined by the principal attribute of extension, right? So it's um, has two species. One of them is race extensa. Race is a feminine name. It's race extensa, an extended thing that is a body. And the other is race cogitas, a thinking thing that is a mind or a soul. So this is why I said when we got to the definition in the second meditation, what am I? A thinking thing. I said genus differentiating. <laughs> yeah. Um, I would say on this part, on like number 58, they have like a phrase, like some things are like concurrent with God and like some things are not. I was like confused about what that meant. That was in section, no, not in section 58. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm looking at 58 and it says the title of section 58 is number and all universals are simply modes of thinking. Oh, sorry, 51. 51. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, substance, a term which does not apply univocally to God and his creatures. Right. Notice God is not in either of these species. God is not in this genus. <laughs> um, I think Descartes agrees with, um, uh, well, at least for sure Thomas Aquinas says this, God is not in any genus. Um, but, Right, so so when we call God a substance or thing, Descartes is saying um, we're uh, using the term substance or thing equivocally. Yeah, I think I understood that part. It was oh. like, why, why does he say like concurrent with God? Like, they talked about the substance of like mind and body, like being concurrent. Oh, okay. In the case of created things, some are of such a nature that they cannot exist without other things, while uh, some need the ordin only the ordinary concurrence of God in order to exist. And so these angle brackets mean that this was in the this is in the French, I believe that's what they mean here. But this is in the French edition and not in the original, but uh, the original Latin one. But I mean, he like. It doesn't mean it was inserted without his knowledge or something. It just means it's a, it's a different version. Um, but yeah, so what he's saying is, so like he wants to, at the beginning of the section, he says, by substance, we can understand nothing other than a thing which exists in such a way as not to, de to depend on no other thing for its existence, right? This That obviously is a version of... Um, the definition of substance, we, implicit definition of substance that we saw in Aristotle in the categories. And uh, even closer, it's a version of Avicenna's definition of substance. Something, right, it depends on no other thing for its existence. But then this, this part in angle brackets is added in because, um, because strictly speaking, it's not true that a body, for example, depends on no other thing for its existence. Because according to Descartes, um, um, just as things came into existence first because God created them, they continue in existence only because God continues to create, recreate them at every instant. 
So that so that right so that that qualification here is that that when we talk about created substances, we don't mean things that don't depend on anything else for their existence. We mean things that don't depend on anything else except God for their existence. And it's right, and it's God's concurrence, right? The, like uh, God goes along with their existence from one moment to the next. Yeah. Is uh, some is the ability to sense part of extension from big bodies like trying to like extend into the world, or is, as it was it always a part of the friends code? According to Descartes. Yeah, so like actually even the meditator, even according to her old opinion, she was never able to understand how bodies could move themselves or how they could sense. Um, right, this is the end of the paragraph on page 81 that I was reading from before. It's on the AT page 26. For according to my judgment, the power of self-movement, like the power of sensation or of thought, was quite foreign to the nature of a body. Indeed, it was a source of wonder to me that certain bodies were found to contain faculties of this kind. Right. So according to the argument I'm about, to, I'm uh, uh, trying to get you to the principles uh, that um, that's the fact that it's not that it's foreign to the nature of body is going to mean that it can't be in body. Okay. Yeah. That's just the word extension. Oh, yeah. So, I, yeah, I guess I should have said something about what extension means. Extension just means... <laughs> um, taking up space. Mm -hmm. Right? Like, or... Um, I mean... So can you define extension as like a discussion of this in Locke where it concludes that you can't define it, right? But, but you know, like it's when people try to define it, they say something like having parts outside of parts, <laughs> right? Like having parts that are outside of each other. That's extension. Yeah. Um, so that comes back to the example that you said at the beginning of the lecture about like how, um, air in the room is considered a body, what does that mean it's considered an extension taking up space? Well it has it, it has extension, right? That is and that's what what Descartes is saying is that's what's essential to body. <clears throat> right? Because it's 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 the differentia of body. So it's what makes body the kind of thing it is. And um and when you think about that it's not unreasonable, right? Like what is it that makes all these things that we call bodies the same? And it's that they have parts outside each other, they, they spread over space, they take up space. In Aristotelian terms, that's like an accident of quantity, right? Like you could say, even if the answer is infinite, you could say there's such and such amount of an extended substance, but it doesn't really make sense to say so how much mind do you have, right? Like it, the air in the room is is this much air and not more than that and not less than that. Well, although you can count, and this number applies to both. Oh, well. So, um, yeah, so it's a little more complicated than that. Also, I mean, if we had more time, I would have, in some years where I, where I, where I had a separate lecture just on Avicenna and Thomas, and I signed part of what Avicenna says about corporeal form and like the way he tries to distinguish between extension that is an essential, that is, that is a differentia of body as a type of substance versus extension that is uh, an accident in the category of quantity. So extension as a distinct and important concept doesn't start with the part. No. Aristotelians are talking about that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And Avicenna uses a lump of wax when he talks about that. <laughs> I, I, whether that means that, that Descartes borrowed the lump of wax from Avicenna or whether it's just that a lump of wax was the kind of thing that was typically would be found on your desk, I'm not sure. Uh, 
<laughs> but they do both use a lump of wax. Oh, for sealing, wax. for sealing, and also, the, well, yeah. So I guess, I guess for an Avicenna's time, did they have wax candles? Yeah, I think so too, but I'm not sure what the history of wax candles is. But anyway, I mean, in, we we people tend to think of the wax in Descartes as coming from a candle, but as I said before, I think it, that maybe the meditations has arrived as a letter, and that this wax is left over from opening the letter. But I'm not sure. Anyway, um, yeah. So there was always wax around. Um, all right, so um, so getting back to the principles, <laughs> so um, um, there's always one principal attribute, back on page 177, principles 153. Um, So I read the title or the um, of the section, and now reading the section itself. A substance may indeed be known through any attribute at all, but each substance has one principal property which constitutes its nature and essence, and to which all its other properties are referred. Thus, extension in length, breadth, and depth constitutes the nature of corporeal substance, and thought constitutes the nature of thinking substance. Everything else which can be attributed to body presupposes extension and is merely a mode of an extended thing. Um, for example, shape is unintelligible except in an extended thing. Right here, we're talking about geometrical shape, not in imaginable shape. And he's right, so. Um, and he's explaining why shape is something that can be in a body. Shape is something that can be in a body because shape is unintelligible without the attribute, the principal attribute of body that is extension. Um, so like, first of all, I guess, do you understand why shape is unintelligible without extension? No? <laughs> well, I mean, shape is like it's contained in that thing where um he talks about um body as being terminated by a shape or apt to be terminated by a shape right the shape is where the body stops Body's a three-dimensional, but I don't have room for that on board. So <laughs> the shape is where the body stops. Stops what? <laughs> stops extending. Right? Like the body extends up to this line and no farther. And that's what makes the shape. So something that's not extended can't have a shape. In fact, something infinitely large. This Actually, Avicenna actually mentions that in this discussion. That's part of his proof that the, the shape is um, uh, an accident of body and not the essence. Like he says, but we can even, we can, no, it doesn't say imagine, but I forget exactly how he puts it, but it, it's, there's no contradiction in an infinitely large body, even though he doesn't think there really is an infinitely large body. Yeah, that's what he means in mass. Because did they think there was any such thing? Well, no, because you know, Aristotelians think that the oh, yeah. that the world is finite. It Descartes. ends at this. Descartes, uh, it's less clear to me. I think he probably thinks the world is infinite, but um, um, but uh, right. Anyway, so sorry, but what I said was not that extension is not intelligible without shape, but the shape is not intelligible without extension. And like the fact that it's not symmetric is, is the key point here, right? That's what shows that extension is the principal attribute and shape is its mode. And 
again, this is like the general rationalist way of proceeding that I was talking about before. The reason you can learn about the world using reason is because you can find that there's certain things that are unintelligible or unthinkable without other things. And that's what shows that they're connected, even though they're different. Right? So it shows that even, even though um, um, the concept of shape is not the same as the concept of extension, right? So that saying something with a shape is extended is not like saying something that's extended is extended. Um, um, nevertheless, you can be sure that something with a shape is extended because there's this relationship where you can't think one without the other. So you can't think shape without extension. And that's enough to show you that shape depends on extension for its existence. So you've learned something about the structure of the world, right? From like everything extended is extended, you don't learn anything about the world. This is what Locke calls a trivial judgment and what Kant is gonna call an analytic judgment. You don't learn anything about the world from everything extended is extended. But from everything that has a shape is extended, you do learn something about the world. And yet you don't learn it by your senses. <laughs> you learn it by reason. At least that's how the way the rationals think about what's going on. Yeah, did you have a question? Um, yeah, I guess I'm just kind of confused. Like, so I don't really understand how a shape depends on, so a shape depends on extension, but a body doesn't depend on shape or so can a body exist without shape? Well, so um, um, we were just talking about an example of a body that wouldn't have a shape, namely an infinitely large body. But I thought a body was whatever shape. Uh, I don't know. I thought, I'm sorry, yeah, okay. Right, so like an infinitely large body, which is at least conceivable, According to Descartes and Avicenna, anyway, I'm not sure if Aristotle would agree with this. Um, or Kant for that matter. But an infinitely large body, which is at least conceivable, uh, there is no termination of its extension, so it doesn't have a shape. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, from my very, very limited knowledge, from one astronomy class, <laughs> I do remember learning that the infinitely large thing that I think we're thinking of, which is the universe, does have a shape, and that shape is a disk. I don't remember how or anything else about it's not it. Not a disk. Um, <laughs> or like a, I don't know. So. <laughs> no, I, I reject that. Oh, that, you disc. totally could. I don't remember why. <laughs> How can it be? It's not a, it's not a disc, but uh, I mean, program. A disc is a two dimensional. Yes. <laughs> but uh, but it, um, yeah. you assume it's expanding at the same speed in every direction on a single plane. And I guess that's what they mean by disc. But I don't know that that's a good definition of what that's, disc is. So, no. All right. Oh, so, no, I, like I, I don't want to I don't want to get too lost in general relativity here uh, and and like try to figure out what Descartes would say about general relativity although that would be interesting it's very difficult <laughs> um, but but the but the I mean when we say when we say that space has a shape we mean that it has a curvature. Um, um, so, like, if you lived on a plane versus if you lived on a sphere, you could tell which one you lived on by seeing what happened to triangles, right? So, like, on a sphere, you can have a triangle with two right angles and another angle. 
Whereas on a plane, you can't because the angles have to add up to 180 degrees. So um, now um, this is easy for us to understand when we think about two-dimensional surfaces that are embedded in three-dimensional space. But without thinking of being embedded in anything, you can just ask like, okay, how about this three or really four dimensional universe that we live in? What are the triangles like? <laughs> and the answer is they're not like this. They're not like this either, but they are anyway. They, um, you know, so like there's a, there's something called the twin quasar but I like to mention it a lot of times. So if you look at a certain direction in the sky, you see these two, do you know what a quasar is? It's like a really distant, very bright object. It's very, uh, it's really, I think we now know it's the, it's the core of an active galaxy in the early universe. But um, so if you, if you look in a certain direction and you see these two quasars that seem very similar, very close to each other, and they both vary, and they vary in step with each other, one of them with a delay compared to the other. And it's weird because even though they look very close to each other, since they're so far away, this distance would be huge. So how do they maintain this synchronization? Right, like signals can't travel faster than light. So, unless it was carefully set up to begin with, like winding up two watches or whatever, there's no way they could have this synchronized behavior. So what was proposed um, to explain the King Quasar and, with, and was eventually accepted, and now we know lots of examples of this, and it's even used as an observational technique, it's called gravitational lensing, is that it's actually just one quasar. And but there's two straight lines between us and the quasar. And they're not exactly the same length, and that's why there's a delay. On the space curves, right? Because there's a, like a massive cluster of galaxies somewhere between us and the quasars, and it's curving in space time in such a way. Right. So I mean, obviously, if there's two-sided polygons like this, it can't be that the all angles of triangles always add up to 180 degrees. I, yeah, I don't know if that's obvious. I mean, because you can draw here somewhere in the middle, you can draw two right angles. So it's like that triangle I showed you on the sphere. All right. Anyway, so that's a way of saying something about the shape of space-time without asking like what's outside it or what it's in or what the its termination is like. Um, but like Descartes doesn't know about differential geometry. I don't know if he would think of it this way. All right, sorry, that was probably a lot more than I should have said about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I guess my big question between objects with extension is, it, is how do you really differentiate between separate objects with extension? Do we have a concept of non-extension that kind of like... Oh, <laughs> that's, that's the $64,000 question. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that's and that's where Leibniz is the end going to say that, that Descartes' picture of body is incomplete, that, that there can't be substances like what Descartes called bodies, because the question is going to be, what is this line? If all we have on this side is extension and all we have on this side is extension, what's the difference? And Descartes does have an answer. Descartes says, well, they're moving differently. But what's moving, right? So Leibniz criticizes this. Also, there's an argument about this in Hume. It's um, basically about the same issue and comes to the same conclusion, although Hume and Leibniz take it in different directions from there. Um, yeah, but so like what Descartes thinks about that, I'm not sure I understand. But I mean, I would like to think that there's something that they don't, that Leibniz and Hume don't realize that Descartes is thinking that would make sense of this, but I don't know what it would be. <laughs> but in any case, um, yeah, so I mean, so in particular, it's true, according to Descartes, there isn't, so like if you thought that there's body and non-body, and they're both extended, 
And this could be the line between, right? Like what Locke thinks. But, but then you can't say that a body is just extended. It has to have some other property, right? Locke says it has solidity. So if you add solidity, then you can say, oh, so there's extended solidity and there's extended non-solidity, and that's what the line is between. But Descartes says, no, and I actually, I think I had you, I, I signed the last thing from the principles I signed was that thing about how hardness is just a sensible quality and is not essential to body. Because, and Descartes says, because if all bodies moved away whenever we touched them, we would never feel this sensation of hardness. Right, so so yeah, according to De so therefore according to Descartes, a vacuum is impossible. A vacuum is is impossible. It's it's logically impossible, right? Because there is no difference between a body and a vacuum, <laughs> right? All there is to a body is extension. What if you just say that a vacuum is a kind of substance? Right, but it's it's going to be the same kind of substance as the body, right? But it's, its attribute is extension, just it has all the same properties of space, of size, and shape, and so it, it is a body. I mean, but why couldn't you say that it is? It would be counter to um, you know conventional wisdom that doesn't seem well, logically. Oh, well, I mean, so that is, you could say that Descartes thinks there's only a vacuum, <laughs> that bodies are vacuum. You could put it that way, but the point is he doesn't think there's a difference between a, a space with a body in it and a space without a body. Yes. This is kind of slightly um, off topic, but well not off topic, but what, what would be Descartes' relation between the mind and the identity? Is it kind of like the mind is the identity, or is it almost the kind of Sartrean, you have this mind and then you can take any identity you see? So like um uh, the word identity so identity means sameness right like idem in latin means same identitas means sameness um, right so like when when Locke discusses the question of personal identity, he's discussing the question of what makes someone the same person as they were before. Um, so uh, um, now we have some other way of using this word. And I mean, it's uh, obviously not unrelated. I mean, it's the same Latin word, but exactly how we got to that, I don't know. Um, and exactly when that arose, I don't know, but a long time after the people were reading. So when you say like my identity, I mean, one way of understanding it is to say my identity is like what I identify with, that, right? That is like what I think of myself as the same as or something like that. Maybe that's where it comes from, but I don't know. There's also, it has something to do with like when we talk about identifying someone and they produce a identification card <laughs> right like um so yeah i don't know but anyway so like so so this the term identity in that way that we use it and i don't know exactly how to define the way we use it but it's like what's important to me about myself or something like that is like not something that descartes talks about he's not using that term um and if you listen to me i just said some things about the metaphysics exercises <laughs> right anyway um uh but but so, but sorry what was i got is stuck on the term but what was the question is the identity even like or does he have like this the way that we commonly conceptualize it Okay, right. So you could add, like, so here's how you can ask that in Descartes' terminology. Am I my mind or am I my mind plus my body? Um, so in this case, the thing that's keeping that person the same is their mind. Um, 
Oh, well, then you could relate it to that more that stricter sense of identity that I was talking about before, where it means sameness. And you could say, yeah, like if what I am is my mind, then um, what makes then the answer to the question about personal identity would be I'm the same person as long as the mind is the same. That's actually the that and that's the view that Locke um, spends a lot of time arguing against. He's arguing against Descartes when he's arguing against that view. Um, so, uh, I mean, there's some ambiguity about this and different people interpret Descartes differently. Um, Descartes does say there's a very close union between our mind and our body and whatever, but I think ultimately he thinks, yeah, strictly speaking, I mean, as you can see, the meditator's conclusion, what am I? I am a race cogitans. And we know now that a race cogitans, that is, we know from the principles that the conclusion we're heading to, although the meditator can't prove this yet, is that a race cogitans can also be a race extensile. Every substance has one principal attribute that makes it what it is. So there can't be one that has both of them. So, um, right. So when I say what I am is a race cogitans, I'm saying what I am is, is a mind. And the body is like maybe very important to me. And there may be a very kind of important kind of quasi substance or entity that consists of my mind plus my body. But it ultimately, when you ask, what is it that I am? The answer is this. Yeah. My question, um, after it talks about shapes and motion being unintelligible without like an extended thing, it also says, I, I think I wrote this down in my notes, it says you can understand extension without shape and motion. I was confused about like how you would do that then. <laughs> I mean, Again, it like I mean, think of this infinitely large body, right? So uh, it has no shape. It can't move because there's nowhere for it to move into. Although Aristotle says, couldn't it rotate? But anyway, never mind that. <laughs> oh, uh, so uh, um, you're thinking of extension. When you think of that infinitely large body, you're thinking of extension without thinking of shape or motion. So you understand what extension is. I mean, I'm not sure if Descartes would make exactly that argument, but I think it's it's good enough. <laughs> right. Um, so, all right. Um, Hmm. How much of this I'm going to get to? You. This this course, in some sense, is going too well because there's so many good questions. <laughs> but I guess I'd rather have that than you know, like me get through all these notes and you have no questions, meaning that you don't understand anything I said. <laughs> um, so, um, but I do have to try to figure out which what I'm. So okay, so I definitely need to say this like. Okay, why well, I think that there's, there's, so there's two parts to this view. One is that every substance has one principal attribute that makes it what it is, right? So remember how different that is from the Aristotelian view, right? The Aristotelian view is like, so Socrates has, it's true, one differentia that makes him human. But then, you know, so that's human, but then human is a species of animal. And there's an attribute, there's, so Socrates has a second attribute that makes him an animal. And then animal is a species of living thing, right, as opposed to plants. So Socrates has another attribute that makes him a living thing. And so there's a whole chain of species before we get to the sumum genus, which is that it's the highest genus, which is substance. Um, whereas um, Descartes has flattened the whole thing. Every substance only can have one differentia that makes it what it is. So that's one part of the view. 
And the other part of the view is that the only properties that, that a substance can have are the ones that are unintelligible without that attribute. Right, I should read that again from page 177, um, that is principles 153. Everything else which, which can be attributed to body presupposes extension and is merely a mode of an extended thing. And the same presumably applies to, I mean, the same definitely applies to mind, although maybe it's a little harder to understand in that case. Is it? I guess the way to understand it again is to go back to that list and see how they're read off the cognitor. <laughs> That's the way of saying that those things are unintelligible without thought. Um, but so in any case, in the case of body, this view that the only properties that bodies have are extension and its modes is, at least this is what sometimes what people mean when they talk about mechanism. The mechanism, at least the way I'm using it now, is the view, again, that the only properties of body are extension and its modes. And Descartes is saying that the modes are the things that are unintelligible without extension. So, I mean, first of all, this is the proof that bodies are not colored, according to Descartes. And is it true that, I mean, actually in the Mino, Socrates defines shape as, Mino asks Socrates for a definition of shape. And Socrates says, it is the thing that is always found with, sorry, yeah, for definition of shape. And Socrates says, it is the thing that is always found with color. <laughs> then Mino says, what do you mean? What if I didn't know what color was? And Socrates says, oh, well, you wanted a fancy definition. And then he says something about the termination of extension or something like that. <laughs> Um, but Socrates apparently thought the first definition was better. In any case, um, so is it really true that color is intelligible without extension? Um, well, it is according to Descartes. The meditator has shown it's intelligible without extension by doubting that there's anything extended and still having apparent experiences of color. Is that like um, hallucinations or? Well, they might be hallucinations or they might be true perceptions, but, uh, or true, uh, like, um, um, well-founded memories or imaginings or whatever. Mm -hmm. But right now we're calling all of that into doubt. So we're not using that to understand them, right? This is, so this is like on page 80. Three, Lastly, it is also the same I who has sensory perceptions or is aware of bodily things as it were through the senses. For example, I am now seeing light, hearing a noise, feeling heat, but I am asleep, so all this is false. Yet I certainly seem to see, to hear, and to be warmed. This cannot be false. What is called having a sensory perception is strictly just this. And in this restricted sense of the term, it is simply thinking, right? So again, like the meditator has reached a point where she's convinced herself that extended things don't exist. I mean, not really. She's pretending to convince herself that, right? Like pretending that there's a, there's a powerful deceiver or whatever. Um, what she's really done is found a reason for doubting it. But, but, but one way or the other, I mean, doubting it or pretending not to believe it at all, um, you can do that. But at the same time, you still seem to have sensory experiences, right? So this is, first of all, like I promised, that the first meditation, when the meditator first doubts the existence of the external world, she doesn't say, oh, but I have sense data. 
sense data wasn't in one of her old opinions. Her old opinion was that sense, that sense perception is a relationship between one body and another body. And this body causes an accident in that body. Um, but the new opinion is that even if there are no bodies, the thing I used to think was sense perception is still there. That's sense data. I mean, uh, I'm not sure if Descartes actually uses the term datum or data in this connection, although he could. Um, but in any case, that, like, that, that's the sense data. And um, obviously, it's conceivable without extension, because I can think that there is no extension. It's still there. Um, now, you might say, but wait, it's not conceivable without like kind of visible or tangible extension, right? Like, I can't imagine color without imagining like a kind of blotch of color or something. But that, again, is where it's so important that we're classifying sensible or imaginable shape with sensible qualities. Right, so that that visible extension is not geometrical extension. It's not the kind that's fit to be the principal attribute of a substance that is everywhere divisible because, for example, it can't take the shape of a Killian gun. Right, so that is, what I what the 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 perception of color that I seem to have, which we're now saying is color sense data, has something that I call its shape, but it's not really shape because it can't be Killigan shaped. So shape, strictly speaking, is unintelligible without extension, whereas imaginable shape is actually a mode of thinking. <laughs> um, all right, but again, the question is like, so why should I think, why, why first of all, should I think that every substance only has one essential attribute? And second of all, why should I think that all its other properties have to be modes of that attribute? That is, have to be unintelligible without that attribute. So, like, again, the Aristotelian will think that, you know, um, Socrates can have plenty of properties that are intelligible without rationality. Um, they're accidents. We can't derive the fact that Socrates has them from something about Socrates. Um, or that even that Socrates could have them from something about Socrates, but there they are, they mean hearing in him, whatever. Why think that that's impossible? So, I mean, it's basically the same rationalistic method. And the analysis in the meditations is supposed to um, get rid of things by this method. <laughs> um, which, and the, the, the method is that um, struggle to explain this. I said it I said it last time this way, but I don't know if this was helpful. That um, when you think of a certain thing, that is what you're thinking of, not something else. So like if I think of an extended thing, this. Here's my, here's, so to speak, my thought. 
extended. This is like my mind. Here's my thought extended. It goes out and, so to speak, hits something. It refers to something outside my mind. What does it refer to? Well, like, what is there that it can, uh, that can determine what it refers to? Nothing except the contents of this thought. And the content of this thought is just extended. So what it hits is exactly what's extended and not anything else. <laughs> so if now I think of something else, that I, I have another thought that I can have without this one, I'm not thinking about this. I'm thinking about some other thing that's hit by this one. Um, again, I don't know if this is a helpful way of explaining it or not. Here's another way of explaining it that um, I think comes to the same thing, maybe, that um, Suppose I can think of A without thinking of B. So, um, um, to me, something that's only A and not B is conceivable. Right? Because I'm here, I am thinking of something that's A and I'm not thinking B at all. So if that is, and the, the step is to say that thinking that something is conceivable is thinking that it's possible. Or not so much thinking that something is conceivable as that conceiving something is thinking it's possible. <laughs> right? That if, if my concept is in good order, if it's formally valid, as Kant would say, um, if my concept doesn't contradict itself, then it has to be the concept of something possible. So here's this concept of A only with no B. It's a concept of something possible. That is, I believe that A without B is possible. So I should say it's possible, right? I believe it. <laughs> it is possible. Did you have a question? I was going to ask if that could relate to that part uh, where Descartes says, okay, well, it's possible that I could not exist uh, if I stop thinking, right? I, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, that's part, like, I could, well, so, all right. So at this stage, again, in the second meditation, the meditator has a, like, it's going to take the third meditation, um, uh, for Descartes to establish this principle. So at this point, the, the, the meditator is not sure that something couldn't be both extended and thinking and, um, or have some other attribute, right? Which is why they say, it's possible that if I stopped thinking, I would cease to exist. But, the, but by the time that we have this principle on the table, it's going to turn out that it's necessary that if I weren't thinking, I wouldn't exist because thinking is my essence, right? And that's the definition of essence, right? An essential property is one where when you take it away, you don't exist anymore. Um, okay, I didn't get to the other part. I guess I will get back to it maybe next time about, so what about the properties that adhere in this thing? Why do they have to be inconceivable without the essence of the thing. Um, but it's, um,
um, it's uh, basically that if I can conceive them without the thing, then I don't really think that they inhere in the thing, that is that they depend on it for their existence. Because I think they're possible without it. So I don't think of them as attributes of the thing, or as, I don't think of them as accidents. Okay, like I said, maybe I'll come back to that next time. Uh, okay, I'll see you then.